Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Tastemakers. I'm your host, Taryn Armstrong, and we are here, of course, to sample all that television and film have to offer so that we can let you know what's good, what's bad, and what's tasty. And uh, I don't know, this week, uh, it seems like there was a lot of tasty things, a lot of things being eaten for uh, from what I watched. Uh, but with me to talk through it all is my co-host, Grace Leader. How are you doing, Grace? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Taryn? I'm doing well. I Listen, uh, last week we said uh, we're going to watch Alien. I watched it. I loved it. Loved it. You watched I'm the first one? Talk about it. <laughs> you watched the first one? That'd be great. We were like, I yeah, I'm going to watch Wait, Alien. No, no, you watched the very first Alien. Alan Ripley, right? Like that yeah. was the... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ridley Scott. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, very fun. Uh, I actually did go back and watch Alien last week because I realized that this movie was taking place after... The first movie is basically between Alien and Aliens, um, which is. Did you, have you seen this Twitter joke? That's like, uh, I think it's like about letterbox reviews, and its review of Alien is like, I really liked it, but I wish there was more Aliens. And then they watch Aliens and it says, "Holy shit!" <laughs> it's their review of the second movie, which I think it's an all-time letterboxed uh, bit. But um, yeah, this one takes place right after Alien, so I re- I did rewatch the original film before I went mm. saw Alien Romulus. Yes. So we're going to talk a little bit about Alien uh, Romulus. Um, it's doing very well right now in the box. Yeah, office. I think 100 million um, um, internationally, I think it's made 100 million dollars. So that's great. Doing very well in China. I, I saw today. Yeah. Um, so uh, we'll talk about that. We also mentioned we, we check out Bad Monkey, the latest Apple TV show from Bill Lawrence um, and uh, some other news. I think that's the that's the agenda today, Grace. Yeah. Um, I feel like I feel like there wasn't as, I wasn't watching as much this past week, but everything I watched, I I thought was at least pretty good. So actually, I have a I have a really big movie recommendation that I forgot to tell you about. I forgot to put on the agenda that I will do at some point in this podcast. It's my maybe my second favorite movie of the year so far. So I'll, get, oh I'll give you that recommendation. Yeah. Well, uh, I can tell you I haven't checked, but I'm pretty sure that Alien Romulus is my favorite movie of the year so far. Oh wow. Really? Um, yeah, I really, I really loved it. I mean, it's, uh, I, I am a fan. Of, so I will, I will give my alien origin story. I guess I'm a fan of the original. You're alien. a robot, though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, alien versus robot. That was yeah, the scrapped right. version before they yeah. went with. We don't Predator. talk about those ones. We don't talk about. Those. Um, <laughs> I was, I, I am a big fan of Alien. I listen. I, I think I've said this before. I'm, I'm a big horror guy. I like the horror movies. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, I, I love the, I love sci-fi as well. And so sci-fi horror, great mixture. Uh, I really enjoy that. Um, and, uh, I, I really enjoyed alien. The first one, everybody also loves aliens. The mm-hmm. second one by James Cameron, much more of an action movie. Yeah. This is maybe a hot take for me. I, my letterboxed reviews would be. Oh, so much fun for Alien, and then yeah. the second one would be too many aliens. Too many aliens. Or the second. <laughs> oh yeah, too many. There's a lot of aliens in this one, Terrence. So it'll be interesting. Uh, there, uh, you know. So, um, so I, I was not as big a fan of the like more action style uh, of um, of Aliens, and so when I saw that that Alien Romulus was going to be kind of like hearkening back to the original sort of feeling of it being a horror movie, it's from uh, a a director uh, who uh, I don't actually know how to pronounce his name. I think it's Fetty Fetty Alvarez. Fetty? Is this right? Fetty, Fetty Alvarez. Alvarez. Yeah. Um, he uh, directed the uh, Evil Dead remake, which I also really enjoyed, um, and uh, and also Don't Breathe, which is a very good new era horror movie. Um, and so uh, I was like, this guy has some genuine horror bona fides. Uh, he's directing. A alien an alien movie that feels like it's harkening back to the original i was like this is this sounds very promising but you know hopefully the trailer didn't spoil the entire movie uh because it felt like it did and let me tell you i will i will confirm it did feel like there was at least one moment that i felt like was very heavily spoiled for me and i wish that i hadn't seen that part of the trailer um but uh it exceeded my expectations i really enjoyed it i thought it really worked as a horror movie it it ends up really being a combination of all the alien movies um, in 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 various ways, 
Um, and I think my favorite part about it as a horror movie is that not only did it work really well, but it also felt to me like there weren't any significant holes in it. Like it felt like these were competent protagonists that were doing their best and just like totally screwed over by circumstances. <laughs> and and I love that. I hate when I feel like the characters are just like doing what they need to do in order for the plot to remain horror movie. Um, and so I for many uh, and many other reasons, I really, really enjoyed this. But uh, Grace. Yeah, I, I, I really, really liked it. I thought this was uh, great. I have watched Alien and I've watched Aliens and I have not watched any of the other ones. And I did plan to do more of a watch through. And then I realized that um, this is set between the first and second film. So I didn't actually like need to do to do that. So I chose not to. Although I do know that, like, I think some of the films are prequels, right? Like they're set before the first film. So I'll have to figure yeah. out how to watch. I, I will say right. I have I have seen Alien. I have seen Aliens. I have seen all of the other Alien. I've seen all of the Alien movies. Yeah. I don't remember almost a thing about any of them except for Alien, the first one. <laughs> OK, I thought you were gonna I'm pretty sure Aliens was just like. Killing aliens. I'm that's all I really remember is that they went back and they killed more aliens. That's that's pretty much what I remember from it. Yeah, but uh, apart from that, I really only remember alien. I think a lot of stuff happens to, to Ripley that I'm completely unaware oh, of. Oh, there's a lot like, of stuff. There's like a kid somewhere that happened. I don't remember why. There's I watched Prometheus and all of those. I just remember there's a big thing that fell at one point and there was some weird stuff happening and you know fast bender was there i think yeah Michael uh, Fassbender's in like the re the ridley scott rebooty stuff yeah so like i watched those i thought they were good but i don't remember what was going on it's, in them <laughs> it's so funny because i thought you were gonna start out that sentence being i was gonna i was gonna joke just at you that it sounded like you were bragging you're like listen i've seen all the aliens and as if like you you have like have a check but like i'm like you collect stamps but instead you like look at all the aliens and then you're like i don't remember anything about all the, any other aliens <laughs> it's just yeah. listen it's the opposite. Just, <laughs> right over my head i just stick give me the horror stuff uh the lore is uh definitely escapes me but but what i liked about this movie is that i felt like i feel like i actually understand some of the other movies a bit more or I remember a bit more of them now because it was right. it was fed to me in a much more horror filled and and uh easily digestible way and again i don't mean that as a pun <laughs> Yeah, no, you said there weren't any holes. It's like, yeah, there's acid holes all over the ship, Taryn. Like, part of the whole point is there's so many holes. Um, no, I really enjoyed this. I, I, I try really hard not to watch tra trailers. I, do, I do like, tr like, and I sit in the movie theater so much, and just to be like, continue listening to the live feed update. I'm listening, to, like, turning it up, and not looking at the screen as I as the trailers come on. But um, so I really didn't know what to expect from this movie, and I kind of even didn't really. Like I kind of knew Kaylee Spaney was in it a bit, but then I didn't. I really like Kaylee Spaney. I think she's quite excellent in this in this role as um, yeah. the I think she's been very good in basically everything she's been in. I thought she was really good in uh, Priscilla. Um, but the other surprise for me is that uh, David Johnson, yeah. who you know I had been watching in industry, and we talked about it in um, one of the episodes. Uh, spoiler he's not in the show in season three he's been like written out of the show um which came to a little bit of a surprise to us. so i was like very excited to see him i think he's also great in this um in this role it's a little tricky i think for sometimes he's he's playing artificial intelligence he's playing a robot i think that that is like tricky sometimes i feel like it's not corny and i don't think it feels corny i think he has like like rides a very perfect line um in in that performance he's also in rye lane which i didn't realize if you ever haven't checked out rye lane rye lane is this like 80 minute um british rom-com that's just tremendous like it was one of the highlights of 2023 so if you haven't seen rye lane go check that out especially if you watched gus johnson in this role and are looking for more of him and you can also watch industry um but i totally agree i thought the idea that the premise of this of this film is that these are pretty regular people. And I think there's like part of in the first movie, in the first alien movie, they are like literally sent on this mission and they're like scientists and whatever. And so the idea in some of these other alien movies, I'm gonna watch all of them, that like they're gonna go around and like touch all the alien stuff. I'm like, aren't you guys science? Like you're scientists, like you should know. Or at least in this, they're all like just trying to you know, the premise of, of what they're trying to do makes a lot more sense that they like how they end up in the situation they are. I don't think I've seen a movie where a giant floating spaceship is basically a haunted house. And I thought this was a great premise to basically 
make a haunted house movie, but have it be set in a spaceship and get to use all the alien stuff. There's some deaths in here, Taryn, that I don't think I've seen in movies before. And that's sort of like a calling card for me in terms of like when I'm thinking back about that, like that movie, it's like, I feel like the premise um, the characters and then like did I see people die in interesting ways I haven't seen them die before it, like the three things I'm looking for I feel like this movie did all three of those things so I I quite I quite enjoyed it yeah and it it looks great uh it especially yeah. for its budget it has like a cool not quite but near feeling real time element to it that I really liked um and uh and and yeah the acting was really fun uh, I thought that, uh, that that David Johnson, who I, I was seeing in industry, but like when I saw him in this movie, he was so good. I just kind of assumed that I've seen him in a bunch of stuff uh, because I was like, oh, yeah, it's this guy. He's just really good. But I only had ever seen him in industry. Yeah, I mean, Ryan Lane didn't... is worth checking out, but he's not really been in a bunch of other s stuff, really. He's uh, mm -hmm. he had to run in a show called Deep State. It was just six episodes like he hasn't been in stuff, but he's. He's quite good. And I think if he left industry because he maybe is getting some, I think he's, there's two more movies that he's in that haven't come out yet. So like, good for him. Yeah. And, and, and also I agree. I, Kaylee Spaney uh, was, was really, really good in this in probably my second favorite movie of the year so far, Civil War as well. Oh, um, that's fun. Those are your two yes. movies. Yeah, probably, probably. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, really well acted, especially for, again, like a more kind of horror movie. Uh, and uh, and like I it, it felt very gut punchy in the right places. There were some fun scares, uh, some great deaths um, and but also like very heavily sci fi, very heavily like themed. The look was so retro future. Uh, and I loved that. It, very, very reminiscent. I think, like, honestly, the most criticism I've seen for this movie is that some people think it leaned a little too heavily on nostalgia and, like, references and things like that, from shots to lines. Um, as somebody that didn't remember most of it, it all worked for me. <laughs> I'm the people same, like, there was like, one line in the movie that was just like, and I was like, nah, that was funny to me. I thought it was a great line. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I heard this too. I heard people talking about like people groaning in their theaters at like some of the ways it was like leaning on the stuff. That didn't happen to oh, me no. at all. There's no way the general audience, as somebody oh. that watched all of the movies <laughs> and that most uh -huh. people probably haven't and don't remember it, there's no way the general audience was like, oh, groan this line. Uh, they I mean, must have I... been seeing it with a film. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Zombie. I think if I think maybe if you went on like a a very first opening yeah. night, some of these movies yeah. do like the fan uh, screening. I'm very fortunate; they live in Toronto, and I'll get a bunch of these like sometimes on the Monday before a movie will release. Um, the Cineplex here will do some some fan screens. You can often get like a movie poster and stuff. Like maybe that type of thing. And these people are so invested um, in it. This is a very interesting franchise. I think that's kind of just like always. Like, I guess not always, but like, you know, they make three movies almost immediately. Is that right? Let me just like get my alien lore here because they do Alien, Aliens, and then Alien 3. And then Ridley Scott, and Ridley Scott weirdly doesn't like it's, it's James Cameron who does the second one. Like, it, um, uh, he doesn't, uh, Ridley doesn't come back. Yeah. James um, comes. And then, and then, uh, uh, funny enough, uh, number three, David Fincher, uh, Oh, that's fun. Yeah, I didn't realize that. I haven't watched that one. I should watch that one. But that was um, a weird one. yeah, I, I am kind of excited to go check him check him out. I feel like I do feel like th there's a there's so much stuff in the alien lore, I feel like in in the things that they can do or how they, you know, and I think the movie does a good job of like playing through all of them. Like, you know, acid blood and face huggers and all this that there's so many different ways that they can like play with uh with the xenomorphs. Um but um yeah i mean what do you make of these like because because disney basically it's very funny that these are disney movies that they also do this was originally going to be a hulu release yeah. which um did you watch prey uh which was the predator like super prequel that they did last year I, the year before i haven't but i was very excited to i just never got around to it but like i was very excited for it in this for the same reason that i was excited for this which is like this feeling of horror esque thing bringing back to its roots uh something that uh fedi fedi, fedi alvarez uh said was like he had the same approach to this movie that he did with evil dead which is like 
I just want to capture the feeling of how people felt when they watched the original movie. Um, right. and, and I feel like he nailed that for Evil Dead and he nailed that for this. Um, and so, yes, Prey uh, is, is one that I definitely wanted to watch. But you should watch you should watch it. It's it, it's really good. It's really fun. It's very interesting. There's like, uh, you know, it's set in like the 1700s and um, uh, has an indigenous uh, woman in, in in the lead role as like predators around in the 1700s. It's 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 very good. Um, yeah, there are these like, you know, especially horror does feel like it, it gets this sort of like cult audience. I mean, this is, I think, uh, probably a different style but there's like the halloween movies that like danny mcbride uh signed up to to do right these like the new truth which like i think you know your your mileage may vary on like the trilogy but the original movie i think was like very fun in terms of like somebody who it seems like they they you know if the idea is give this franchise to somebody who loved it and cares for it and i think that there is this critique of like oh it's so like it's so nostalgia focused but that's not how i felt in this movie but i think mm. i think it is a good approach to give the movie franchise to somebody who has a fondness for the universe the world and then let them try to do something different in, in, this, movie. in this movie i mean i have a couple knocks on it um and they should be things that like shouldn't work there's a whole sequence at the end of the movie taryn that i will not spoil for people that like that shouldn't really work but it but it does like the yeah. sort of like final bossy moment um and and then there's obviously like uh there's there's a technical choice they make uh in the middle of the movie that if you've seen it you should know what i'm talking about um that i think like i don't know but like for the most part it does feel like this is a very like lovingly crafted movie, which is funny to say about an alien movie um, that I think really stands out. I think that there are these other, you know, Prey is a good example uh, of this where like, yeah, they're just going to give these sort of horror franchises. I'm very excited for like Robert Eggers is going to do Nosferatu, like not exactly the same. It's like a very old movie, but like these people who like have a fondness for the thing, they're getting to like try their hand. If we're stuck in like, everything has to be attached to IP, Taryn, this is the way it should be of like, yeah. Um, let these people try these new interesting directors try new things with the with the property. Yeah, I agree. Um, Fede, Fede is Fede. Uh, I believe okay. the correct pronunciation there. Um, one more fun fact that the Alien movies they've had such uh, 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 so many directors, uh, so many mm -hmm. great directors for the Alien movies. Uh, one of my favorite directors, Jean Pierre Junet, uh, did Alien Resurrection. Um, but everyone hated that one. But I, I oh, actually really? thought it was fine. Um, <laughs> well, you've seen all the aliens, so. <laughs> uh, I, you know how I know I thought it was fine? I gave it a higher rating than Alien 3. <laughs> Where do you keep your ratings, Tim? What is you, and, and also, now I want to ask, uh, Civil War, this is your favorite movie in Civil War's number two? That's what you have? That's uh, that's probably like, true. And then, like and then uh, I think probably Deadpool or Hitman number three. Interesting. I'm Maybe I'm I'm, four. I'm Zendaya fan, fanning and I have Dune and Challengers. My oh, sorry, favorite. Dune was still there and Challengers. Well, yeah, where's Challengers? Hold on. See this? I'm not organized here. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Um, we should put together. We'll put together at the, like a letterbox list for. Oh, like, I forgot to rate Challengers. That's a problem. Yeah, yeah, Challengers is in there. I, I sometimes I had, get to rate movies because I have to come all the way home first. Oh, I'm doing it like as I'm leaving. I want that like, <laughs> I want that like, this is how I feel. And you know what? I very rarely do this, but the movie that I'm going to talk about, the that uh, that I'm going to give the high praise for, which we could probably segue into, um, I I rated it five stars on Letterbox, And then I realized I had given Challengers four and a half stars. And I don't want my my list ranking to be like a movie that has four and a half stars and then a movie that has five stars. So I retroactively had to give challengers five stars. I feel like that's like disabusing the system that I have that like, this is the rating I feel when I leave the movie. Um, but it's the only time I've, I've done it. So yeah, I, I bumped, I gave challengers a, a bump. The movie that I watched Taryn is called uh DD. I believe that's how you pronounce, uh, mm -hmm. pronounce it. Um, Dee Dee is a, uh, a movie by, uh, Sean Wang. It's his directorial debut. He got nominated for, um, a short film at the Oscars, uh, last year, um, called, um, I'm, I'm going to try and get the name of it, but it's about his, his two grandmas who live together. Nanai and, 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 and Weipo. I think I'm probably butchering. Uh, D I D I. 
that's how you spell it. Um, and search twenty. The apparently there's been a lot of movies uh, named this. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> yeah, search Sean Wang and and uh, and Didi. This um, right, I got it. I got it. This movie premiered at uh, Sundance in January. It won the Audience Award um, and the uh, Jury Award uh, for the Best Ensemble Cast. Um, it is about uh, a boy uh, named Chris Wang who grows up in 2008. So for me, there was a feeling of like, it's pretty close to the time I grew up in. I wouldn't mm -hmm. have been, I would have been 17 in 2008. So I'm yeah. a little older, but the way that, that the director uses things like um, AIM Messenger and sort of the start of Facebook. And there's a way in which, like, um, I heard him uh, do this interview where he, somebody asked him, like, it feels like a lot of people, uh, directors these days, actually choose to set their movies in, like, 1988 or, like, 19... So that they don't have to actually worry about, like, technology and how to translate cell phones and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Like, it feels very, like, inorganic. And he just manages to capture the way it felt in that era of, like communication technology becoming more prevalent in our in our lives i'm such a sucker for a coming of age story this one in particular i think is excellent because i think it's um you know i i'm i'm not i wasn't like um an immigrant to canada like my parents were white so that that experience watching that there's a he's called wang wang in the movie a lot and and that's totally derived from him just being like his name is chris wang and people be like we'll call you wang wang and him being too self-conscious to like you know, be like, don't call me that. I don't like it. Like, just call me, <laughs> call me Chris. Um, mm -hmm. in a way that feels very like that. I think happens to a lot of uh people who are, you know, um, their nationality is 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 not like uh white. So I, it's just it's so good. And then the I, the way that Sean plays with like in the movie because it's like kind of semi autobiographical, like to a to a degree. But just the way that like when you're a kid at that age and the way you like make mistakes and you know what you should be doing, but you do like is a very good way that he uses AI Messenger where like he types out a thing and then he like deletes it all and writes something else. And that you feel that the and you're like, no, no, don't do that. And it's just like a it's a story about like a 13 year old kid. I highly recommend it. Um a friend uh, uh Phil T uh, Phil Torres uh, also gave it five stars on Letterbox and said the movie is amazing. So it has the Phil T stamp of approval. This movie is so great. Highly recommend if it's playing near you when it comes to streaming. However, you have to whatever you have to do to catch it. DD is one of my favorite movies uh, of the year um, for sure. It's it's tremendous. I guess DD means little younger brother. So he's the younger, but he has an older sister and he gets called DD at home. So all right, wow, yeah. Uh, okay, then um, let's. Let's move on from movies. Let's talk about some shows. Uh, Let's do it. We're going to watch Bad Monkey. I watched two episodes of Bad Monkey. Terran Apple TV. Um, yeah, a sort of uh, black comedy drama. Um, a little bit longer than I thought it was going to be. I believe you last week pointed out. You're like, oh, no, it's an hour long. Uh, second episode is like, it's like more in the 40 minute mark um but basically uh you know andrew yancey played by vince vaughn is a detective who at the beginning of the show is not working is like off the off the you know taking a little break i think it's forced by his by his work mm -hmm. and sort of gets looped back into uh, basically discovers an arm um and gets looped into a case that he would like to figure out and we also there's some other characters that seem separate but you very quickly by like the end of the second episode realize how they're going to be looped into everything that's happening has a very like tropical like florida theme to it um that feels very summery i thought aesthetically the show was great i thought the, the so far i'm like interested enough in what's happening on the show i think Vince Vaughn is quite good in the show i don't know that it's like excellent but it's it's like good enough i think taryn i don't know what do you think about bad monkey yeah i it just wasn't it's just not for me uh yeah. i and i got i honestly i got the vibe instantly uh <laughs> like the uh -huh. opening scene i was like oh this is very quippy um and like fast-paced dialogue but like not in a way that feels particularly clever to me like not it's just not my comedy i guess um and uh and man it felt like that pace of dialogue just like never let up and it was just like constant quippy dialogue and it just never felt like i was able to really get a sense of the characters uh very deeply um and i wasn't super interested in the plot uh and uh yeah i mean you know i i could have probably stopped halfway through but i finished the first episode and i was like 
yeah, I think uh, I think I'm just gonna pass on this one. That's uh, it's just gonna be a, a pass on this one. Um, it's, it it listen, it definitely fits a vibe that I'm sure some people might be into. Um, just not mine. It's not my vibe. Yeah, I mean the quipping there there is a a Ted Lasso nature to it without having sort of like I think whatever whimsical magic Jason Sudeikis has to make Ted Lasso very charming. Like it, there's a way in which I know people are annoyed, like get annoyed by Ted Lasso. I'm not mm. one of those people. I think he's like utterly and delightfully charming in a way that I I don't even really understand. And like Vince Vaughn is like. It's not on that same dial. He's not on that same frequency, but he's trying. Mm -hmm. It's like trying the same thing of like this very like jokey, bantery thing. But like, if you don't have the magic of the, if you don't have the magic charm, it's like not working as much on me as it. As if it I may, here's here's my theory that I just came up with in the moment for Bill Lawrence because Scrubs is one of my favorite shows of all time. I think he made some great shows. Cougar Town was fun um obviously uh ted lasso was really really good for a season and um and so well for a season you said well, listen I mean season two was fine it was fine um so here's my here's my theory that i just came up with on the spot which is that i think bill lawrence is a master of comedy that injects the occasional piece of really serious drama um, and I think that's what like Scrubs is the perfect amount of that where like Scrubs will really hit you hard sometimes, but most of the time it's just a goofy show. Um, yep. and I think the same thing was fairly true of Ted Lasso in the first season. It was more comedy with some serious components and then getting into season two and then in season three, it got very heavily drama focused with the comedic element still there. And for me, that's just not working. Um, this show was had a tone that was way too serious for the amount of comedy it was trying to fit in to me. Um, it's too long for uh, for this much fast paced comic comedic sort of dialogue. I totally um, agree. And it when in the plot is too serious for it. I want it to be if it's going to have this tone, I need it to be shorter comedy first, drama injected rather than this longer drama focused with comedic elements on top uh, style. I just don't think for me that's working with Bill Lawrence. Um, there's also an interesting choice about the narrator in this thing that actually, you know, it's funny this, you know, I think Apple TV would much prefer that I actually like just watch this, you know, I watched the show. Actually, they probably don't get anything out of me buying the book, but I did order the book because I'm like, I'd heard people be so excited about this. And this is a um, a show that's been in the works for a long time because they've like, we're, I guess we're so excited to figure out how to adapt it. Um, I think it's been like seven years, something like that, when he bought the rights to the, uh, and he spent a lot of money um, on the thing. So um, I'm kind of more intrigued after the first episode, first episodes to basically like, get the book and read the book um i i i don't know i feel like i'm i'm in the zone right now term where i feel like a lot of the stuff that is out i like watch it and then i i i'm like i don't have this like urge to go to go back to it like i think I, like sunny and time bandits and bad monkey all stuff that i was like that was good but i'm not like you know ready to go the, the exact day it's back on uh there's a new episode those are all apple tv shows i believe uh yeah yeah yeah, I mean, I, I, honestly, like, uh, I, I usually like narration um, for the most part, I think. And, and I honestly, I think this show could have used it because I was, you know, again, when I hear too much quippy dialogue, I start to zone out a little bit. And so I wasn't paying super close attention to the plot. And I was like, OK, but the narrator will catch me up. But I felt like the narrator was not catching me up. The narrator was just like throwing on flowery prose on top of what was happening. And I was just like, I, I don't even know what the narrator is saying. Um, so yeah. two, I have two major like consistent, like continuity or like consistency, like, th like things that bug me more than anything. And one mm -hmm. is I don't mind a narrator, but you have to have a consistent narrator when a narrator is like only at the beginning of the episode and then forgotten about f forever. I hate that. I get really annoyed by it. Or like they show up like one time later. And you're like every time the narrator talked, oh. I was like, oh yeah, I forgot there was a narrator. <laughs> Yeah, but at least that's better than like you know, like you yeah. know, they're like they like do a narrator device at the beginning of the show and then don't use yeah. the narrator throughout the rest of the show. I get like so annoyed. Um, uh, one thing I, I finished the sympathizer, which I thought actually had like such a good uh, uh, 
not narration, but like the, tr the, the thing that they use, the mechanism yes. they use to tell that story of like him retelling the story mm -hmm. uh, is so good. I finished some of the, the, the some of that was amazing. I thought it was really tremendous. Um, the, the other one I hate, Taryn, I hate when there are pictures or video of people within the universe that clearly were taken by professional like cameras or do you know what I mean? You know, when like yeah. a, it's like a pic, it's like a video, it's like a home video, but it's shot the exact same style that like, yeah. that like the TV is like the show is filmed in. It drives me. And actually I thought Abbott elementary, I've been watching that on my Emmys. I thought that they did that. And then they're like, how'd you get such professional footage? They're like we film a documentary and I was like, wow, that's so good. They like explained how that they got the good footage. So uh, mm -hmm. very impressed by Abbott Elementary. But uh, those are my two core. Those are my two, like, I can't stand it when it's like, you wouldn't have that type of photo as your like family photo that you were, you know, it's like, doesn't make any sense. But whatever. Very fair. Uh, all right. Anything else on Bad Monkey? No, I will, I'll, pr I'll probably check out another episode. But if, you know, if it's like, you know, yeah. I like Rob Delaney a lot. I'm happy. I'm happy that he's in the show. And Alex Moffat, too. I quite like Alex Moffat. So. There's some people in the show I'm interested in. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, we did uh, get some news that Dark Matter season two was officially uh, is officially on. It's green wow. lighted season two renewed for season two. Uh, we I think kind of expected this. I think the show did decently well and it clearly was setting up uh, for a season two. Um, we've already kind of talked about this, but like it's interesting to me that the writer of the book is show running the show. Uh, and in this particular instance, even though there is no second book for Dark Matter, uh, he clearly has something, uh, I assume, ready for it. Um, we'll see if it's if it's if it's like a creative idea or a the show did well enough. And so I'll, I'll, I'll come up with something kind of idea. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of I think we talked about this, but like there's a lot of season twos of shows that were either based on a book that don't have a second book like shogun uh or like you know the show is like a murder mystery and there was a resolution in the first season and then it's like hey but we're gonna do a second season um one show actually just briefly that did that really well was search party uh i don't know if you ever oh, yeah. watched search party but like <laughs> i love search search party is a show that you should we should just watch the first and last episodes and see how dramatically different the show is. It's like not the same show. It's so but it, I I totally agree. It like found its footing as I don't even know what I would describe. So if you ever watch Search Party, have fun. Have a It's an experience. It's it definitely is. worth checking out. Um but uh but yeah, I'm I'm curious to see what we get from Dark Matter season 2. Yeah, me too. There's um Jess, Jess was uh chatting with us about how Bad Sisters, which is an Apple TV uh sort of dark comedy, it also was a murder mystery in season one, which I didn't actually know. I need to check it out. One of those shows I, I heard people really the people who were watching it really loved it. And I was like, Oh, I'll watch that. And I never got around to it. And it's one of those things of like, I don't know if it's coming back or I haven't really heard anything about it. Um, so I didn't watch it. I will watch it now, knowing it's coming back in season two. And that's one that Jess says, like, I don't know how they're gonna like what they're gonna do because sort of like season one feels like a complete premise that um not that it doesn't need more but you know it's 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 that that thing of i think similar to this of like like okay there's nothing there's no like there's no um text in which we can like go to and be like okay now we will continue adapting what we have which is which is a really interesting thing for these shows that are that have been successful get renewed and are sort of like delving into you know, new content or they're writing new content or, or whatever they're doing. Um, it's good. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of like, I think Apple TV has a lot of like quietly good sci-fi stuff. So um, yeah, uh, I'm excited to see what they do with uh, season two. I can't get out of my head that whenever Josh talked about him being the most boring time traveler ever, which I think is, <laughs> is, is accurate, but I still did quite like the show and I'm excited to see what they, what they do with it. Yeah. Um, all right. Any other shows that you want to Um mention? apparently Emily in Paris came back mm -hmm. and people are liking it. Another show that I haven't really ever checked out, but I feel like I should just because it does seem to be a little bit of a cultural sensation. Um, you said you've watched a little bit. I I have really like no sense of what Emily in Paris is, other than that I presume Emily does go to Paris at some point. She does in the oh, first man. episode. Wow. Well, okay. Well, uh, <laughs> sometimes they gotta you gotta have a hook. You know, they gotta get you. In. They gotta reel you in. Yeah. I mean, this this uh, it, it's now in. I think just dropped season four. Yeah. Um. Yes. Yeah, just 
a few days ago. Um, and uh, but it was originally launched in 2020, uh, season one, um, and it, it immediately blew up. I mean, yeah, it, uh, I like it, it quickly, you know, came into my radar. Uh, I I watched the first few episodes, and it just again, this one definitely not for me. I actually I I I thought it was like not very good. Like this is one where I was like, actually, I think this is like not a very good show. Um, but I think I understand the appeal of it, um, because I mean, it's, it's just like, you know, it's just like pretty people having relationship drama and being pretty in, in, in Paris and in, in Paris is pretty. And it's just kind of fun to watch visually. Uh, and, and it's got enough of like, uh, a hook and enough of like an American, very American perspective mm -hmm. of Paris and French culture, uh, that it feels, it feels very kind of like safe, uh, as an American to watch it and be like, oh look, it's Paris. Um, and so, uh, I certainly wouldn't like, you know, look down on anybody that enjoyed the show. I think I can absolutely understand the appeal. Not, not for me. Um, but, uh, but man, it definitely has been quite the phenomenon. I presume this season is an Olympics crossover season. Emily in Paris, right? <laughs> I would hope so. Yeah. Um, no, my boss was saying, and actually I didn't realize this, they, this is a, this is a, a split season. Uh, this is a uh, five episodes dropped earlier this, uh, or late last week and five more will drop on September 12th. So they're splitting oh, the yeah. season, which is indication that it's probably strong enough that like the reasons they do this typically i think netflix's primary reason to do this and maybe the only reason it does it is basically if you're signed up to watch emily in paris you will subscribe in august and you'll subscribe in september then their numbers are up and is that a quarter shit what's the qu i don't think that's quite a i mean i guess you'd have some overlap into q4 really getting corporate here um but that's interesting that it's a i feel like that's that's really um indicative of how netflix feels about that show because the shows that they've done that with are like they're doing it with cobra kai which we talked about which the other reason for that is probably like they can call it all one season and underpay people um which kind of sucks um but like bridgerton and stranger things like they're kind of like their hits is is basically like things that they think there's people out there who will pay just because emily in paris season season four part two is on the platform i gotta keep I got to keep my subscription into September. So that's, that's telling. I think of Emily in Paris. This is a show that I feel like did blow up and then I didn't hear. And, and like every time like the show comes back for a season, it's like, Oh yeah, Emily in Paris is on. And then it like disappears into the, into the void. That's kind of like the feeling. I, like I really, yeah, I, mean, I, I think really, it, it, just, yeah. it just hit that. Like uh, it hit like a cultural moment and it's just kind of like been, been riding that for a while, I think. Um, yeah. And it, it's, I think very uh, representative of, the Netflix approach to content in general, which was like just shotgun approach. Uh, and then occasionally something will just randomly hit. And I think that that was, that was what Emily in Paris was. It just was like, I don't know that they expected it to hit in the way that it did, but then it blew up and now it's, you know, now they're just, they're rocking it. They're rolling it. Uh, and, and, but they didn't do that with umbrella Academy, right? They like put out, I mean, that's, that's shortened. It's like six episodes. So maybe they just didn't feel like they could split it, but like they didn't do that with that. They just, put out six episodes mm -hmm. two weeks ago yeah um they also dropped uh the union which is like this like mark Wahlberg, halle berry movie that like i had not heard about until nothing but netflix is covering i think puyan chappelle chatting about it that like are they gonna keep doing netflix is probably gonna stop doing that right just giving monstrous amounts of money i presume to mark Wahlberg and halle berry just to like have them <laughs> on the front of the thing like they don't need to do that right they're so big they don't really i mean i guess well, they just I can they I feel like that's that. that's their approach. Their approach is similar with movies, where they they have made so many like mid budget. And this is where mid budget movies go, right? Like to Netflix, uh, to just kind of like exist there. Usually, some kind of like action movie, maybe, uh, or some kind of you know comedy. And I think in this case, it's action comedy. Um, and like so many of them are bad and I never hear about them. Um, and I feel like it doesn't work the same way that the TV shows do. But you do occasionally like uh, I think when they do put a little more effort into it, it, it probably works a little better. Like I said, I really en did enjoy Hitman, um, which I believe. But, him, was... but, but Hitman they bought. Hitman they bought out okay. of the Toronto yeah. National Film Festival. So that makes so more they, sense. 
Yeah. So I think like, I, I yeah, they can have some success with that. I'm, I'm very excited. I'll just say it, like, I'm, uh, should be attending the TIFF uh, festival. Um, uh, I believe our friend Kevin Jacobs is going to come as well. And we've, uh, he's yeah, maybe we'll give you a little bit of an update about what we saw at TIFF. Mm. Um, but, um, it should be interesting to see what like Netflix bought a lot of stuff. They bought some movies that they haven't released yet. There's one called uh, Woman of the Hour, which is Anna Kendrick's like di dictatorial uh, directorial mm. debut. That's about her on a game show. Uh, it's based on a true story of like there being a serial killer on the panel um, and like being on the, the show. Um, and so it's based on that. It was very good. Um, it hasn't come out yet on Netflix. So that's interesting. But so it'd be interesting to see what they buy this year. Although last year the festival was full of like actors who were directing because of the writers strike so basically like you couldn't have any of the actor and the actress you couldn't have any of the actors or writers like do q and a's so if you had a director who directed the movie then they could do the q a afterwards so you it was full of like ethan hawk directed a movie michael keen directed a movie um vigo mortensen directed a movie and a kendrick directed a movie. like they they just had all these movies with like famous directors um that was a really interesting approach and this year should be different because it should be a little bit more back to normal um be interesting to see what netflix buys and what other folks buy out of the the festival but yeah these movies where they're just like i mean they have adam sandler locked up to a deal and i think um j-lo and those movies like pop off and then i'm like all right like spaceman was a spaceman i think was adam sandler's new movie it was interesting mm -hmm. it wasn't like the greatest movie ever but i just know that they need to they they can just like i don't know they could just add interview with the vampire and i think that's going to blow up today as it gets added to netflix and like but I don't know. Maybe there are a ton of people watching these, these movies. I don't know. The union. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'd never hear about them. Um, so I actually, I actually have a special filter on like my release calendar just for like Netflix movies because I will otherwise never hear about them. And most <laughs> of the time when I see them, it's just a bunch of stuff that's like, oh yeah, people think this is like a five out of 10. Um, it's like, okay. Mm. Uh, Anyway, um, I didn't want to mention I I have now gone back finally to uh, the talent of Mr. Ripley. I read the first book. I'm, oh yeah, I'm almost done with the second one. Oh, um, I I I bought the, I put in an order of just like shows and movies that uh, are interesting, and I wanted to read the books and uh, the second uh, Ripley book is uh, the one I bought as well. So it's coming. Uh, I thought it was very it, it, definitely the show is a lot more uh, sort of loyal to the book and the events of the book. So there were a few key differences that I thought were very interesting. Um, but uh, I, I mean, man, I, I hope we get more uh, oh, me Ripley, the TV show. Me too. Um, I did see that he, uh, Andrew Scott just finished filming as a bunch. Everybody just finished filming uh, the latest uh, Knives Out mystery. So potentially opens up some calendars, uh, you know, to look at another season of Ripley. I don't know how well it did. I feel like I didn't hear much about it, like how successful it was. Uh, maybe the Emmys though. If it, it, if it could be an Emmy a, wins. Yeah, yeah Emmy it's wins gonna, could help. The only thing that's going to bury it is probably Baby Reindeer because it's like they're both up in limited series. Um, the thing that I really liked about the book and then the show, and actually an adaptation, a, a way that the show adapted the book is that the book is from Ripley's perspective, and I would say the show is too, except you're like not in his brain. You're not I in think his head. Yeah, and I think that actually is like super effective in terms of this is Ripley is a is a character who like almost doesn't really know who, who he is, and he has this idea of what he thinks he wants. And the more actually that is articulated, I think the less successful. I mean, I think the book is 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 really great. Don't get me wrong, but I think there's like this really great choice, and and almost like the way that um, the show ends up being in black and white, not to just like keep uh, you know giving our laurels to to ripley our favorite show of the year um i wonder if that's changed we'll, we'll talk about that soon um which is that like the movie is so like yeah why wouldn't you want this work like not that you know they you gotta commit murder but like yeah you can see the appeal of like living in italy with like jude law and like you know like hamming you know going to these parties and the music and the lights and how fantastical it is and ripley is so like toned down to a degree of like Really, you could go to all this to, like, you know, for for this. Like, I go walk up the stairs all the time. You know, like uh, Italy is kind of like you know, it's maybe not all it's cracked up to be, and yet like he's so unsure of himself and who he is, and for any number of reasons you can imagine that like I think it's a really compelling story in a way that I think is more faithful to the book than the movie was. So yeah, it is. It's very interesting to me. Like one of the strengths of the book is how how really well realized uh, Tom Ripley is as a character. 
and how explicitly it's laid out for us in in not like a, a super like there's there's a lot of subtlety and and nuance to his character but it's like very much in his head fu fully fleshed out realized character and there's so much strength to that in the book and all of that goes into subtext in the show yeah. um and yeah. that's that's really compelling because it still exists but it's fully like you have to pay attention you have to see it um and i think that works a lot better in a show uh than it does um than it might in a book too so uh yeah interesting stuff if, if we're on books gonna give you i did finish two nights ago i finished uh one of the red rising books taryn you are oh, a red rising reader right yes I, yeah one? we're totally in book i finished dark age so i have one more i have Lightbringer. Okay. i think it's behind me i, have I haven't more. started Lightbringer either yeah. yeah i have Lightbringer. um and they're just chunky books so it's like you know i'll get to it at some point i'm taking a break. i'm reading a, a, a tiktok recommended book that like every tiktoker that is like you gotta read these books has this book called stoner on it so i'm reading stoner it's like a 200 ish page book that i'll probably get through pretty quickly and then i'll dabble with whether i want to get back into red rising if you've never read red rising it's a sci-fi sort of uh sci-fi book um the premise at the very beginning is about this this guy who lives on mars and works in the mines and the and then it's sort of like set in the f future um, where like the world ascends to hierarchy. So if, if you are like uh, um, like low level, he's he's a red. So he's low level. And the idea being what a terrible system. Maybe the red should rise up. It's a um, it's a revolution too much yeah. kind of story. It is yeah. uh, very battle royale, very hunger games for the first, the first book one. Especially. Yeah, super. Um, some people really like that. Some people didn't. A lot of people that didn't like the, that concept uh, loved when the, the the future books that opened it up a little bit more. Um, I like both. Uh, I don't think anybody dislikes when it opens up more in general. I think that like it, it works I really well. And I uh, I might have mentioned this before. I highly recommend the audio book uh, okay. for uh, Tim Gerard Reynolds is a, a fantastic narrator. And then once we get to the, the later books that uh, Grace, you're into now, uh, we get even more narrators. Uh, so the thing things. is that there's an original trilogy and then yeah. there's sort of this like, what do you call it? Quad the sequel trilogy yeah yeah but it's four of. books it's, it's not a trilogy anymore yeah yeah so it'd be four books uh it's like uh hitchhiker's a sequel in five parts or whatever mm -hmm. um the, the the way i describe the book is it's so fun and there are moments that i'm like that that pierce brown the author will like intentionally not tell you something so that he can have a very fun reveal at the end of the chapter he's very very good at like ending the chapter and i think there's a way that you could get easily annoyed and so funny because i mess it my brother has also he he read it and then he went back and started again when i was like i'm like three books in i'm like oh this thing is this is weird that this thing happened and he's like i don't remember that i'm gonna start again so he started again i think he's already like finished it again but like there's mom but the text exchange between me and my brother is probably so funny because it'll be me being like, oh, my God, this is so stupid that this thing happened because he loves like, basically every sci fi trope you could ever imagine. He basically will figure out how to work in this book. But then I'm like, I'll finish the next chapter. That's like because it'll leave me on a cliff. And then I'll finish. And I'm like, that's fine. That was so fun. That was so fun. That was great. I love it. You know, it, it's like I definitely have this like love hate relationship with it. And I think if like if you take it too seriously, I think or like I, I think you won't enjoy it but if you just like go along for the ride that pierce brown wants to take you on it's it can be very very fun uh and very satisfying so it yeah, is I just finished the second book in the in the second mm -hmm. four book trilogy or whatever it yeah. is very over the top uh so the and top. and schlocky i would say it gets a little more like it gets a little more nuanced uh, over time um it gets a little more like serious uh if that makes sense Serious isn't the right term because it's always serious, but like it gets a little less over the top while maintaining that level of over the topness. I think uh, a I little think less he's, schlocky. He uh, he starts to branch out with the characters that he yeah. does. So so I think in some of those stories, you he finds I think a balance between like who's over the topness is like in which part and which part is more. But it's, and, it's and he very, does do a good job like intertwine them all. So it's very fun over the top. You know, we talked about uh, those about to die and how that was a little Spartacus esque. Um, yeah. It has that kind of like over the top kind of like action uh, feel to it, but with um, it, like, again, like a more nuanced, like it's not all that, like there is some, some uh, actual substance beneath the surface. Um, and, and this wasn't wasted time either, because this is something that may end up on your TV screens at some point uh, that um, uh, the author um, uh, Pierce Brown has Pierce been. Working on an adaptation for this uh, series for a long time. 
Um, I believe currently set to be a TV show uh, and he's still trying to make it work. So Universal Pictures something. bought it and scrapped yeah. a movie and then he has uh, written out how it would be a TV show. Um, and he says he's had interest from from things. This is one I think between like this and then Brandon Sanderson, like whenever yeah. is, is Mistborn being Mistborn, uh, Brandon Sanderson, another like kind of prolific Mistborn, kind of I think is author. one of the big ones currently being worked on for Brandon. Um, but he's he's working a lot and Brandon Sanderson has the resources to make it work. He just wants to make sure it's done right. I think both of these, I think anything that Sanderson comes out with has the potential to to blow up. He is the most successful fantasy author like out there pretty much. Um, but I think I do think Red Rising, if it hits TV, if it hits the adaptation, I think it will be very successful. Um, I, it, the, the thing for me, I think that I would have to forget is it has so much Hunger Games ness to it that for me, I was like a little like, ah, oh, we're doing that. We're doing this. We're doing it. And then and then I think you eventually like so it would have to sort of like get through that and not lose people, I think. Um, but. I mean, it could, they could do it. And also, I think that I think there's an appeal to that, though. I think that yeah, it's know, like a hook and then it's a really easy market. I think hook it hooks then... in that young adult audience because I think it really works on that level. But it also has more than enough to hook an adult audience. Uh, and so if I guess I with the caveat, of if it's done well, if it's done right, I think it could really be a hit. I think it has so much appeal uh, on so many levels. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sanderson, certainly he's very interesting because I think like um, I don't know if folks followed uh, that he basically decided to write a bunch of new books and then he just did them as like a Kickstarter or like whatever that yeah. thing. Whatever. I think it's Kickstarter. I think he broke he's, the he's record. Just, yeah, he's just crushing on Kickstarter. And, and he and so he just basically self-published and released it. And so that's a guy who I think like will not sort of budge on making yep. that work, which I think could be a good thing or a a bad thing but he is the guy who also like took over uh finished wheel of time mm -hmm. um as as well so he he i mean yeah his, his credibility is probably the best fantasy uh writer out there uh at the moment most successful think, at the very most least successful I mean, he, yeah. yeah that's probably the better way to put it um is but yeah i've been having fun I'm, I'll, I'll pick up uh I'll, I'll pick up lightbringer at some point but these big chunky fantasy but like sci-fi books it's like, I'm like okay all right i'm gonna dive into it you know and it takes me like a little while but um so i just finished dark age it was very fun all right uh okay anything else briefly before we wrap up here no, I was we talked about a lot, Taryn. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Oh, I wanted to do in the future, if, just to mm. plant this idea in your mind. Uh, and we'll edit this out if you don't like it. But um, I love listening to you pull sound clips uh, from Big Brother. And in future weeks, I would like to find the most applicable way to use your Big Brother sound clips, but related to Widow scripted TV. I don't know if I saw anything uh, that like, uh, did I watch anything like heavily like romantic this this week? And you could play the saxophone music, but I don't really think I <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right i don't know what fits that but you know every week i want to see if we could work it like uh you know a great uh a sound clip that you pulled and apply it to our unscripted content or our scripted content i should say mm. oh we'll see maybe Just uh it. yeah we'll work on it uh all right well that is what we have for you then this week uh, we will of course be back next week to talk through some things um nothing like super big i think on the radar for next week, we already mentioned Pachinko is going to uh, start I don't watch airing Pachinko. its season two. Uh, I, I very much doubt I will be able to catch up on that show, uh, given that um, it just in general will take longer to watch a show that has uh, that is in a foreign language to me uh, because it requires a lot more focus. Uh, I can't just turn it on in the background. Um, so that's probably not one that I'm going to be able to catch up on, but I do want to watch it eventually. Um, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Interview with the Vampire uh, has just dropped on Netflix. Yeah. Um, I uh, I don't know that I'll be able to uh, catch up on that necessarily either. But you should um, not try to catch up. But you should you should you should watch any one episode. Is what I should is what I would. I think people, if you have time, people should watch the show. I think it's tremendous. But uh, yeah, The Crow comes out um, this Friday, which I mentioned. Yeah. Another thing that's like. We're just adapting. We're adapting <laughs> something. Um, I like Scars Guard, so we'll see. But uh, I haven't heard good things about the crow. But we'll see. Maybe we'll yeah, I'm not sure. I'm noticing anything that's like standing out to me in terms of movies. Uh, I've definitely seen Blink twice trailers a lot. Um, but who knows? I don't know if it's gonna be good. Uh, yeah, I don't even. Yeah, Blink twice. I don't even. Is this Tate? Is Channing? Channing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
uh, Zoe Kravitz, the uh, writer director. Um, That's interesting. Oh. Yeah, okay. uh, I mean, it would be cool if it was good. Um, this, this, this is Taryn. This is this is basically like the second dump window for movies. Uh, it's like there is January, February, and then there is this like really the end of August is like the worst time to put your movie because basically. Um, one thing is like a lot of people go on vacation or away, whatever. Like you would think a summer blockbuster, but the time you get to August and then, and then it has no opportunity for tail because like students go back to school, all of this stuff. Like you don't have, which like, I don't even know if that matters anymore because like movies seem to go on streaming like five days after they are in theaters, but that's the general idea. So a lot of movies get dumped in these next few weeks. I don't think it'll be a big movie uh, time for us in the next few weeks, as you can tell by like bad news that they're putting the crow um basically the last weekend in august second last weekend mm. of august yeah it's bad news not good all right well stay tuned for uh what we'll have for you the next week then we'll see if there's anything uh to uh to talk about and in the meantime uh check out the industry coverage uh by grace um any anything exciting happening over there there is actually exciting news that if uh, you're a fan of Jess Sterling's takes on Succession, Jess Sterling is actually going to join me for the episode three recap as Josh and Emily Fox are gallivanting all over the world. So um, Jess is going to be joining me to recap episode three of Succession or Industry. Not to say, we should, we probably will talk about Succession too, uh, but uh, it's been very good so far. It's been very very good. I've I've really really enjoyed the show. It's the type of show that I feel like puts themselves in corners that they then have to figure out how to get out of. And so far, I think they're doing uh, a great job of like maneuvering where we, where we went. Um, so it's been fun so far. Yeah. Check it out. I also forgot to mention this earlier, but we, uh, Grace, we had a chance yeah. to talk to Abigail Thorne um, from, uh, from the uh, finale episode of House of the Dragon season two. Um, she's also a uh, big YouTube creator, with Philosophy Tube, um, and she was uh, Miss Terry on The Getaway. Um, so you you may recognize her voice, you may recognize her in general, but uh, very fun to talk to her about like what it's like to work with HBO on such a like massive show um, and what the process was like getting the role and uh, the approach as an actor. A uh, very fun interview. Just hung out with us for almost an hour. Like a tremendous was very uh, open. It was a very fun interview. I thought very um, enlightening. There's like she got very like emotional, like like telling the story of like getting to be on house of the dragon and like the culmination of what that meant for her is very cool. It's a very fun interview. And I did, it did, it did get me there. And I, I bit the bullet. I'm, I'm a Nebula subscriber. And I feel like that's really mostly through to the work of you. And then it was like, all right, I'll do it for Abigail too. But yeah, <laughs> but now, and now I can watch the getaway. I'll watch it and then watch all your great coverage of it. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, stay tuned for all the other stuff going on. Of course, uh, big brother and all that stuff. But uh, in the meantime, thank you all so much joining us here today and we will see all of you next time.